Hey guys, how are you doing? Happy Wednesday. I'm Jennifer Malloway, dog trainer and behavior consultant. And today we're going to talk about resource guarding. Um, does anybody here have a dog who acts like they don't like it when you come near their stuff, their food, or maybe they growl at you when you're, uh, when they're on the couch or your bed even? Um, that is all stuff that um, we would put under the umbrella of resource guarding, um, some, some ways that that kind of manifests itself. And today I put together uh, something a little bit different than normal. I'm gonna um, put, a, put a presentation up on the screen and we'll kind of talk through it that way. Um, so uh, yeah, and you know me, I'm still uh, always figuring out the tech stuff. So uh, hopefully this goes smoothly. Let's try it out. Um, ooh, you know what else? Where are my comments? Hey, cool. <laughs> oh, Jason, hi. Uh, howdy from Tennessee. Got my wife and daughter on here for a while. Oh, cool. Hi, guys. <laughs> How are we doing? Um, oh, a break from school. Uh, yeah, well, hopefully they enjoyed the, <laughs> the puppy and dog video in the beginning there. Um, and Christopher, yeah. Yeah, there is a term for that. Um, resource guarding, sometimes if, you know, we, we talk about specific versions, you know, food guarding or object guarding, we'll get into all that in a second. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, you're headed for a quick road trip, Jason, in, in the boonies. <laughs> cool. Well, I, hope, uh, I hope your signal sticks around, too. Um, wait, Impartial Geek, I was about to say that you are resource guarding yourself? <laughs> oh, I missed something. <laughs> um, okay, so let me see if I can do this. Oh. Yay! Okay, cool, it works. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so resource guarding, let's dig in. Um, uh, the stuff that we're going to get to talk about today is we're just going to go into like, why does it happen? Um, I already described some ways that it can look, but uh, I'm going to show you some other examples because it can it can look a lot of different ways actually. Um, and we're going to talk about um, how dogs use these different the different body language to communicate, and then um, what you can do about it. Um, so, uh, and I want to say this up front: if anybody has any questions. Please ask in the comments because um, this is the beautiful thing about live video is that we can uh, we can have a dialogue and this is um, this is a really common issue and uh, so yeah if you've got questions ask away <laughs> I, I know I won't be able to cover everything uh, in here so if you've got anything specific do let me know um, so let's start let's start here <laughs> why is my dog being aggressive. <laughs> um, I find that the best way to explain the concept is to talk about human examples because we, you know, we do the same thing to be, to be quite honest. Um, so let's say, you know, we, you have stuff you value. We all do, right? Um, and it could be anything from the french fries on your plate to your, <laughs> the dessert that your partner is stealing, or even, you know, the valuables that you have either in your car or in your home or in a wallet or a purse. Um, we, we all have stuff that we value and that we would be upset if someone took, right? Yeah, makes sense. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, and so how would you react if someone tried to take those things, right? Um, some of us don't mind sharing our food, of course, but if you're the type of person who gets really annoyed when someone tries to steal a french fry off your plate, um, you're gonna have some feelings about that and you might react in different ways depending on the situation and who's <laughs> who it is. Um, but but you probably, if it bothers you, you're gonna give them some kind of warning, right? Um, and when it's something even more serious, like if someone were to walk up and try to take your wallet or your purse, you're gonna you're gonna probably have a reaction that would be classified as aggressive, right? Um, <laughs> Garden girl, hi, cool, welcome, welcome, and thanks, say. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun making the presentation, so I'm glad you guys like it. Um, so let's uh, let's keep going here. So. Uh, yeah, what does this look like? Uh, I, <laughs> I, had to, I had to borrow David for this. Um, but yeah, you can see in his face in this picture here, um, that's not exactly happy emotions, um, but you're gonna have some feelings. You're gonna have some negative feelings when someone tries to take your stuff. Um, and yeah, so if, if you would in any way, shape or form, let someone know that you're not cool with them taking your stuff, 
that's resource guarding. That's all that is. Um, Jason, <laughs> I bet David guards his tacos. Uh, you know what? Luck. He just he just makes sure that I always have my own tacos. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> Christopher, yeah, that photo is so real. <laughs> funny, funny. Um, so there we go. Um, yeah. So it's exactly the same for dogs. It's it, the exact same thing is happening. They have stuff they value and they don't want it to be taken away. Um, now we, with our big human brains can think like, well, I just gave it to you. I'm not going to take it away, but dogs don't really have that capability. They don't really think that way. So if they've got something they value, it doesn't matter if you just gave it to them. It doesn't matter if you never take stuff away from them. And it doesn't matter if they've never had a shortage, if they've always had plenty of food. Um, this is just a this is just a behavior that that comes along with dogs. Um, now they they don't all resource guard, or they don't all resource guard to the same extent, and it doesn't always look the same. Um, but it is a perfectly normal dog behavior, um, and like I said, it's it's super super common, um, and. The thing is, since they don't have words to, to tell us, <laughs> hey, you're making me uncomfortable, you're too close to my stuff, please back off, you know, they have to use their body language. And the ways that they let us know to back off make humans uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, despite our discomfort, it is still normal. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, Val, hi. My dogs are like that. The little ones care, but my big pit doesn't care. Yeah, it's it's funny. You know, it it seems there there doesn't seem to be really any. At least I haven't noticed any pattern as far as you know, breeds that guard more or. Well, no, that's not true. Actually, you know what, you guys? I always talk about golden retrievers, and I I use them as my example of like the overly like friendly and gregarious dogs. But that is the one pattern that I've seen is that golden retrievers seem to guard to resource guard a lot more than other breeds could be could be totally anecdotal but that's that's been my experience um but but other than that no I, I haven't really seen any patterns you know any dog can guard small or large any breed whatever um and hi Randy welcome <laughs> it's good to see you here um I'm doing all right um okay so what's what could this look like uh, I said it could look a lot of different ways um but there's there's some patterns. Um, so starting from the, uh, the lowest to the uppermost uh, behavior here, um, we're going from probably the, the, least, they, the least uncomfortable and least threatened they feel to the most. Um, so if they have something and they're at all uneasy about uh, another dog or a human um, getting too close because they're scared they might take it, um, the dog probably, they would start by moving away. Um, and this could look anywhere from uh, just turning their head away with the object to actually fully moving their body and facing away from the, the other person or dog, or it could actually be picking it up and leaving the room. Um, but moving away is the least confrontational uh, way for a dog to just let us know that they're uncomfortable with the situation. Now, um, most of the time, uh, dogs will they'll start somewhere on this list. Now, not all dogs uh, start at the same at the same level, um, and they don't follow every step. Um, but these are these are just really common and it's a common order. And at, if if their early warnings aren't heeded by the dog or the human, um, then they feel the need to escalate. So that can go up to, you know, freezing. A lot of times, you'll see a dog just just suddenly stop moving. Their muscles get really tense. Um, and this is often accompanied by uh, just like lowering their head over the, the object or the food, whatever it is they want to guard. Um, they freeze and they kind of put their head down over it. Um, also, this can be accompanied by a really hard stare. So they might be staring right at the, the person or dog, or they might just be kind of staring off. Like you'll, it's, it's kind of like a weird glossy stare, um, but, but they'll be freezing, lowering their head and just like staring. like. It's, it's pretty clear. Oh, can I make it larger? Uh, I don't know that I can. <laughs> I, I'm, that's, that's my fault. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know I, how to, I don't know how to make these adjustments yet, but I will learn, Garden Girl. <laughs> and hi, Brenda, welcome. 
Um, so yeah, so again, uh, if those early warnings not heated, um, some other things that you could see are the dog, if, if it's a food, um, if it's food that they're guarding. Oh, Christopher, you're asking if I can zoom in too. Um, I don't, I don't know that I can guys. I'm sorry, but I will, I will continue to explain it. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to read through everything too. So if, uh, if it's hard to see, I apologize, but, um, you'll hear it. I can... I can make a PDF of the slides. Oh, beautiful, great. <laughs> I will do that for you guys. Um, okay, so, oh yeah, you're welcome, garden girl. Um, yeah, so uh, the eating faster is a really interesting one. Um, if, they're, if they're eating and someone kind of approaches their, their area, um, you, you'll see a dog either start to consume their food faster. Um, sometimes they get really like punchy. They'll like punch their nose into the bowl as they're eating and it's, it's kind of, I, I, funny is not the right word, but it's, it's an unusual behavior. Um, and again, if, if the, the person or dog doesn't back off, they're go you're going to start to get into growly territory, um, and maybe snarling. They start to lift their, um, their upper lips, showing just their, their, um, upper canines. Um, and when people really start to get, uh, uncomfortable, if it is, if the dog actually snaps at you, um, and I, I do, um, I make a point of distinguishing between a snap and a bite because a lot of times, you know, I hear people say like, oh, he tried to bite me. Um, but dogs, for the most part, I mean, they're fast. Their reflexes are, are a lot faster than ours. And for the most part, if they intended to bite us, they would make contact. So if they're snapping, um, it's an intentional miss. Um, and it's, it's because they don't like, they don't want to have to be aggressive. They don't want to have to escalate, but they feel pushed to that, that intensity. Um, so you'll get the air snapping, um, which is a really, really big warning. And then of course, if, if we're still not backing off, um, then you, you may end up with dogs who actually bite, um, and they make contact. And, um, uh, in the, in the dogs who bite category, you're going to, you're going to find, um, another spectrum of, of how much damage they do. Some dogs will, will bite and they will really inhibit the force of their jaw. So they're not doing any damage. Um, and if they're not, if they're if they're making contact but still not doing damage, um, usually that gives us uh, a better better prognosis of uh, how, being able to resolve the issue. Um, so so that's kind of how uh, their their warning system, right? Um, and uh, like I said, you know, not all dogs will go through every step. They won't all start at the same step. But the more warnings we have, the better. Um, so. All right, let's do something. Let's do something a little fun. Um, if well, <laughs> I think it'll be funny for me anyway. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Um, but I think it'd be fun to come uh, up with like a, a human warning scale like this. Um, and so if you guys want to give me some suggestions in the comments of you know we'd start uh, at the lower end might be your pretty mild. Well, we're talking the French fry level. Um, if, uh, if somebody was coming for your fries and you wanted them to leave it alone, where would you start? What would be the first thing you would do? Um, and we'll kind of go up the scale because probably moving away is a good one. You know, <laughs> I like in the like in the picture of David, you know, we might start by, you know, making a face, giving them that look like, mm, why don't you keep your mitts off my <laughs> off my French fries? Um, but um. But if they kept eating your fries, what would you do? Um, moving away is, is a pretty non-confrontational way to clearly let them know that you don't want them to, you know, pick up your plate, move it away. Um, a glare, uh, hard stares on our, on our dog list, um, but a glare, that, that goes along with, the, you know, like a look, giving a look to, to somebody. So we kind of have a little bit of similar body language in these early steps. Um, but as, as we move up the scale, um, say, say we're getting into somebody comment, like <laughs> reaching for your purse when you're in public or a wallet, if you're a guy, um, what, uh, how, like, like your feelings are going to be a lot stronger. Um, and you're probably going to move into like yelling at somebody territory. No, let's go back a little bit first. If 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 you're like moving your plate away from somebody and they are still trying to eat your French fries, eventually you're gonna say something. It might just be like a hey, 
um, or eventually maybe a, a more forceful like stop it. Um, what else? Um, but but yeah, if if so if it's somebody that you don't know, especially uh, Brenda, yes, block their hands. Um, like use physically blocking them. Now we're getting physical, right? Um, and if they still kept coming, um, or like I said, if it's if it's if it, if the resource is something more valuable or more important to you, um, you're gonna get even more physical, probably. You know, um, I don't know. Like I'm, I we all again, we, he, us us humans are individuals too, and we're gonna have different ways of handling these these situations. But but you know, moving up that ladder um, to to more extreme levels, you might. Um, it, it might be, you know, in, more than just a, a hey or a stop it. You know, you might be, like, yelling at them. You might be calling the cops. That's that's another way to handle this. Um, if you were, uh, if you're the type to <laughs> to pull out your own weapon, you know, if you, if you feel pushed to that level to actually have to defend your stuff or yourself, um, bring in a weapon. Like, that's probably top tier. That's where we get into, the, like, bite territory. Um... And none of us wants to have to do that, right? Like, like those upper levels, that's, they, uh, along with that comes a lot of, like, negative feelings that we're having. And we don't want it, like, we would much rather have just dealt with it down on the lower rungs, right? Um, and I, I go through this to, to illustrate that dogs don't want to have to do that either. Um, a dog who's, who's growling, snarling, snapping, biting, doing, you know, anything in those upper rungs, it's not because they want to, it's because they feel forced, right? Um, so our goal, if we, if we want to stop a dog from doing this, is to not make them feel that way in the first place, which means we kind of have to recognize the early signals, um, that, that their emotions are changing, that they're feeling uncomfortable. Yeah? Um, okay. So, oh, one more thing. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot this slide. But I, uh, I wanted to mention also, uh, you know... Does, does anybody dislike it when your dog begs at the table, like begs for your food? If you shoo your dog away or tell them to leave you alone, guess what? That's resource guarding. <laughs> um, it's it's exact same thing. You know, um, there was a really nice infographic made by uh, somebody, and I was just trying to find it, and I couldn't. But it's a really, really nice um, way to illustrate that the, the things that we want from our dogs are like it's a whole list and it's exactly the same things that that they want from us and this is kind of the same thing it's like you know we don't like it when our dogs come for our food but like when they show that they're uncomfortable about us uh, us being near their food it's a different story just just kind of a funny little comparison there Brenda <laughs> I'm a fighter <laughs> oh that's funny um, yeah, I mean, you gotta, you, you gotta defend your stuff, right? If, oh, hopefully you're never in that situation, but, you know, we all, we all have our limits. Um, and dogs do too. So, uh, moving on to recognizing, uh, some of their other body language I want to point out here. Um, uh, a few examples. So, uh, on the left here, our little brown dog, um, is guarding, uh, you can see in the corner, well, maybe you can, if, I uh, hope, maybe not if it's blurry, but you'll see, uh, <laughs> if I can, if I can provide you the slides, um, there's a there's a treat pouch in the bottom left corner here, and there's another dog approaching, and he is given some very clear warning signs. Right, he's got those upper canines bared. That's a very clear signal that the, the that a dog is uncomfortable, and um, and what's sad is that I see a lot of like what's supposed to be cute, funny dog videos just all over the uh, all over the internet and dogs are making this face and people are like oh he's smiling or oh it's funny and and it's just like I see that and I'm like that dog is very uncomfortable like help him <laughs> um, but you see um, you see some other things here too and uh, the the reason I wanted to show some pictures is because if um, the the more the more that you study like see what dogs look like the better that you're gonna uh, be able to recognize it in the moment because it happens it can happen really really fast uh let me see what garden girl you're saying uh i've never been afraid of dogs always had a dog cat or two or three <laughs> uh but the neighbor's dog was loose and you weren't aware um walking up my driveway and you bent over to pick up a letter and the dog charged that can be terrifying yeah um the dog gripped your elbow, you yelled no, and ran through the garage into the house. And the dog chased you 
all the way until you got into your home. Yeah, oh my god, I'd be, I would be terrified too. Like dogs, especially if it's an unknown dog, like you, you, um, you just don't know. You just don't know what they're, what they're capable of. I mean, for the most part, dogs are not, they're not going to do, they're not going to do a lot of damage, but they're out there. You know, it, it happens. Um, the sad thing is that like, uh, the, the story, the worst stories about dogs, dog attacks are the ones that get the most press. Um, and it's, and it's sad for dogs, but, but, um, and luckily, Garden Girl, you know, you've you've had a lot of dog experience, so you've got that, like, that padding. But if a person had never owned a dog and they went through this, like, they would be traumatized. I mean, you might still be traumatized, but, um, but yeah, no, that that kind of behavior, when dogs uh, feel the need to, to be more um, uh, offensive rather than defensive, um, what, what I described just just in that ladder was was a very defensive look um, at the dog's behavior. Um, but a dog, uh, actually a friend of mine, Rochelle, asked a, a question um, that I said I'd answer today about this because her dog, um, she says he will actually, if he's, if he's got something, you don't even have to be near, well, he doesn't do this with humans, but he does with this with other animals. Um, you don't even have to be near and he'll like take his thing and like run up and growl at the cat with his uh, bully stick or something, you know? And, uh, that that that's a dog who's like very uncomfortable he's he's got a much wider um or a, a a much larger radius of where he's comfortable with other animals being near his stuff um and and feeling like he needs to take an offensive stance and that can be that can be a really complex issue um but but yeah let's um let's look at these pictures so uh it, our little uh, brown dog on the left here um in addition to those teeth bared which is probably the first thing that you notice um you can also see he's got his ears pinned back um he's got his brow uh furrowed um and he's got a very that's that's that hard stare i mentioned you know he's it's a that's a glare <laughs> um and i wasn't there for this one but he you know he might be growling also um, so, and, and he's probably got a very stiff, um, he, he's probably frozen in a very stiff muscles, uh, kind of, kind of posture. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, you know, and if he was doing the same thing, but no teeth were bared, um, I, well, who knows? I don't know. That dog is still, uh, still standing right there. So he's not even heeding this dog's warning. Um, so... Who knows what happened after that? <laughs> I could ask my friend, but um, but okay. Our uh, our second example here um, is this little Boston Terrier, and I know this this picture is kind of dark, um, but but I was there for this one, so I can tell you, you know, he was guarding a toy from a human, which was me, um, and from a from a freeze frame uh, picture context, you know, you might you might, this dog might look like he's just playing, right? You, you don't really know, which is why it's always important to uh, just be aware of the larger context. Um, but I can tell you what was happening. Um, so I was approaching him with the camera, obviously, and he had a toy that he wanted to guard. Um, but he is, he's given me that hard stare. He's keeping his face, he's, his mouth on the toy, um, but he's keeping it really low and just giving me that stare like, lady, back off. Um, and I can't remember if he was giving me a growl or not, but it was it was very clear in the moment um, that he wanted me to to back away. Um, and so you know this that this guy you know he, that was that was a lot more subtle than our first uh, example here. Um, and some people might not recognize that as guarding. And then if they don't if they don't give that dog space and that dog feels pushed to escalate to a growl and a snap and a bite, um, then uh, it sort of feels like. Well, that came out of nowhere. Like, why is he all of a sudden being aggressive to me? Um, which is why it's so important to recognize our early signals so that we can respond to our dogs um, before we make them more uncomfortable. Um, and uh, say, this is crazy important to learn because all dogs are different. They are. Um, and they react differently to this. They absolutely do. You know, it's it's the same. Like, we, we value stuff differently than each other. And dogs, same thing. Um, our, my third example here is a, is a dog who's very ball crazy. So the ball is like the holy grail. Like, she will guard a ball to the ends of the earth, you know. <laughs> um, say says, my dogs are okay with me, but they do... Uh, they do react like this with other people touching their stuff. My beagles are way too friendly, but the poodles are not as friendly with strangers. 
Yeah. Um, again, it's it's a really good point about um, who who is near their stuff matters, right? Um, maybe they're fine with, with you, but they don't trust a stranger. It could absolutely be uh, something like that. Um, but they're, they're individuals. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, third, third dog here, um, again, is guarding a toy, uh, this time from another dog, um, our little uh, Bernadoodle <laughs> on the left. Um, and you can see the, the, um, the Border Collie mix, you know, again, she's got her head lowered over the, the valuable object. Um, she's frozen there. And uh, it's a little, she, she's, um, she's, not, I can't see her teeth in the photo, but she definitely has her, her upper lip lifted a little bit, a little bit of a snarl. Um, and uh, this one, she's got that hard stare and she's just kind of staring down at the sand, but it, she's, she's frozen staring um, and might've been growling at the other dog, you know? And, and just like we have to learn uh, the dog's limits, you know, other dogs have to learn each other too, which is why it's so important that they get experience with other dogs. Um, preferably as puppies, um, but that, the, that we keep them uh, socialized to so keep their social skills sharp. Um, because if they don't know, if they don't know how to react to other dogs who are giving them warnings, um, that's how, that's how they get into little arguments um, or worse. I don't know. <laughs> uh, garden girl. I have three cats now and one is a scaredy cat and will growl at a cat she doesn't like. Uh, is some of your advice for dogs and, and cats want, um, uh, you know, it's a really good question. So a lot of the training advice that I have to share just in general um, could absolutely apply to cats too. Not all of it because they do, um, dogs are a much more social species than cats. And so it's, it's, I'm actually less surprised when a cat is growling at strange cats because um, they're, they're more, they're, they're just less social, um, so their, their behaviors might be slightly different, the ways that they communicate might be slightly different. Um, the most common example that I, I think of is like, you know, when a dog is, is rolling over on their back and exposing their belly, um, that's a really, uh, I hate the word to use, use the word submissive, but it's, it's like a, an appeasing gesture, whereas for a cat rolling on their back and exposing their belly also means exposing their weapons, right? Um, so, so in some ways their body language and their behavior is, um, is very different, but, uh, Randy says cats have a mind of their own. I mean, they do. Dogs have a mind of their own too. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I do have a, a dear friend who is raising a puppy and a kitten right now. And it's, it is interesting to kind of talk about like what, what applies to the cat as well as the dog. Um, my two Russian blues are so gentle and lovable. I mean, I, I do love cats. I, I had a cat before I had a dog, uh, as an adult and I, I, I miss her. Um, but yes. Okay. So let's, let's keep going. Um, I have an, a video here of, um, some, oh, wait, can I, can I pause? Okay, good. Cool. Um, so this, uh, I just want to explain it a little bit first so that you can, uh, watch it and see what, what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is Dizzy who you may all have, <laughs> have all met. Um, but he is guarding a bully stick. He's got a bully stick in his mouth and we've got this puppy over for a uh, board and train. And, um, just, just for some background, you know, Dizzy is Quite, he, he can be quite a loud garter when it comes to other dogs near his stuff. Um, he will, he kind of jumps to, um, a, well, not always, but, but he can jump to a very quick uh, growl, snarl, snap. Um, and he might even like chase a dog off. Um, and so it is really interesting to see the subtleties of how he adjusts his guarding behavior for this puppy. So I'm going to go ahead and play here. And um, you'll see, he, he just stands there and he kind of holds the toy and he lets, he see that he's moving his head away. So that's first, first rung on our little scale. Um, he's not moving away, so the puppy has a chance to come back because this puppy's still learning um, about what's appropriate dog behavior. She kind of walks away and he's like, okay, all right, you're gone. Maybe I can start to, start to relax. See, he starts to lie down here, but puppy comes back. And so he's got to move his head away again. And you might see his, he's, you started to see a little bit of um, upper lip retraction, start of a snarl. And puppy doesn't take the hint. And you'll see in a second here, 
he does a quick uh, quick motion toward her. I'm going to play it a couple times. But he lets her get away with kind of mouthing the thing until... Yep, there it was. Did you catch that? Um, he finally has... He wants to really let her know, and it's that quick... Yep, one more time. <laughs> I just... I love watching this, too, because just studying dog body language is, is interesting to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, and she finally, you see, look how she's walking away. She's like, oh, man, I really got told off. Welcome now, he didn't stick, Abby. <laughs> he didn't make a sound that whole time, right? Um, he kind of, he was just holding it out of the way, moving it away a little bit. He let her, he let her mouth um, a little bit, hoping that she would kind of take the hint and finally felt like he had to really let her know, you, you got to back off. Um, and she did, finally, okay. Um, and it, so it's just... It's so interesting to me um, to see how they they can absolutely adjust their behavior um, based on who the other the other social uh, dog or or uh, person is. Um, in this case, you know, and, and not all dogs would would be so tolerant of a puppy, um, but Dizzy was here, and uh, and I'm so proud of him. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so. What you, what you would do here is just, you know, get that puppy another bully stick. So that's what we did. <laughs> um, all right. So what do we do about all of this, all of this body language, all of this um, aggressive looking behavior? Are we working presentation? Perhaps. So something to note is that things have changed culturally. Um, it used to be uh, that we just left dogs alone. You know, it, the, the common advice was that if a dog is eating or chewing something, or it has, has a toy or food, you just leave them alone. And people would get bitten and we would blame the person. It would be like, well, you should know better than to, to bother the dog while he's got his stuff, you know? Um, that, was, that was the cultural norm. Um, and somehow uh, things have changed quite a bit. We have we have a lot higher expectations of dogs now, um, and lower tolerance of any aggressive looking behavior. Um, you know, and it's it's it can be really unreasonable to expect uh, an animal uh, who's feeling uncomfortable or threatened to not express it, um, because like as as we talked about earlier, like we do the same things. Um, it's it's a re it's a really um, absurdly high expectation of dogs, um, but it's just it's just worth noting um, how how things have changed that much. Really interesting. Um, so, what are your choices on how to handle this kind of behavior? Um, if it's your dog, uh, you have a perfectly reasonable uh, option to do nothing. That's that's absolutely a viable option. Um, go back to those days of just leave the dog alone. Yeah. Um, I think that this is an okay option if uh, there are no children in the home, if the dog is not overly stressed by the situation, um, and if no, no biting and no damage is being done. Um, as long as everybody in the household understands to uh, recognize and respect the dog's feelings and things, you can, you can absolutely do nothing. You don't have to address this. Um, it can also be a, a fine option for um, dog to dog resource guarding. You know, uh, if they get in the occasional little argument, uh, say we, we mentioned this uh, on Monday, I think Monday or last week. Um, yeah, if, if dogs are getting into the occasional little argument over a toy or something and they work it out um, on their own, you can absolutely do nothing. That's that's not um, that's not something that you have to expend time and energy on. Um, so yeah, that you can do that. Um, but if you'd like to do more, if it's really making you uncomfortable, um, you can put extra management protocols into place. Um, and that means to just avoid the dog's triggers, um, prevent the problem from ever occurring. Um, and some ways that you can do this, depending on your household, your dog, uh, the, the number of pets that you've got, um, you can feed dogs in entirely separate rooms or even just uh, use a gate to keep them away from each other. 
Um, or uh, if it's humans, you know, again, feed the dog in the other room or just somewhere away from a lot of foot traffic. Um, you can, uh, if it's chewies that they guard, you know, you can give them only in uh, a crate or in a certain space um, where no one's going to bother the dog. Um, you can keep the valuables always picked up so that there's never the off chance of uh, a dog and a person encountering the thing and have, you know, experiencing some of those, uh, those feelings. Um, and uh, if this is the kind of thing that you only see when the dog is out in public, a muzzle can be a really good option just to make sure that everybody stays safe. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, management as a as a category um, is you can you can absolutely uh, end your your intervention there. That you don't have to do more than that. But um, you can also use it in conjunction with training. Um, so just because. Uh, resource guarding is a really normal, really common, uh, innate behavior, doesn't mean that we can't change it. Um, and this is why this is one of my favorite topics, is because it's one of my favorite things to train, um, because there's, there's really, really, it, it tends to go pretty quickly, like relatively quickly, like um, training for resource guarding, obviously it depends on the, um, the individual dog and the the um the triggers that they're encountering um and how much time you have to devote to it but you can absolutely like fix resource guarding in a matter of days to weeks unlike some other uh behavior problems um and the training that you would do to uh to address this is called desensitization and counter conditioning that's the gold standard for uh fixing the problem um and what that essentially does is it teaches the dog that not only is having people near their stuff okay and safe, but it's actually really nice. Uh, good things happen. Um, we want to prove that humans are givers, not takers. Um, and now uh, to, to accomplish the training successfully and to have it go that quickly, it is important to also uh, make sure that you're uh, tightly managing the situation during training. Um, and then once once it is complete, there's a little bit of uh, maintenance to, to upkeep, <laughs> uh, to keep the behaviors that you've taught. Um, but I, I find it to be uh, really rewarding to, to work on this um, and, and makes everybody, dog and people, feel a lot better about it. <laughs> um, but really, really, really important to note is what you should not do about this problem. Do not punish your dog. <laughs> um, punishing a dog who is already uncomfortable is likely to result in increased aggression. Um, if, you, uh, if you punish a dog who's who's expressing discomfort um, and growling, it might work to stop the growling, uh, but what you then have is not a dog who's safer to be around, but a dog who's still uncomfortable, but now they're just not letting you know. So if they are getting more and more uncomfortable, but they've, the, the growl has been punished out, guess what that dog's gonna jump straight to the snapping and the biting. Um, so we like growls. Keep the growls. Growls are information. Um, thank your dog for the warning. Back away, regroup, and make a plan uh, to either manage or train. Um, but yeah, no, no punishing for aggressive behaviors. Um, that's, that's a good way to get into a little bit of hot water. Um, now, in this, uh, in our little talk here, um, I, I'm not going to go into a like the full on, uh, full on resource guarding behavior plan because it is so individualized, you know, based on your dog, your home, your situation. Um, it'd be really hard to, uh, to give, to give good advice, essentially. Um, it's, it would just be a lot. Every dog is different. And, um, also, because we are uh, in the aggression, aggressive behaviors territory, um, it just, it would be, it wouldn't be good <laughs> to be given um, specific information in this format. But what I can do is um, tell you where to start. It would be really, really important. Uh, whether you choose to go the, uh, the management route or the training route, uh, you've got to know your dog. Um, so start by identifying what are the things that set your dog off. Um, if you literally write it down, make a list of the the types of people or dogs um, or the places that they guard or the things that they guard. Um, and the more specific you are, uh, the 
the easier it's going to be for you to, to address. Or if you're working with a, a trainer, um, the easier it is for them to help you. Um, if we can be very specific um, about what, what triggers your dog. And the secondly, uh, identify what your dog uh, looks like. What, what are the behaviors that they use to tell you that they're uncomfortable? And um, if we can really uh, hone in on the earliest signs of discomfort, um, like, like the moving away, or uh, we didn't even cover on that list, but there's others like um, if, little, uh, if they just lick their lips, um, that, that's a really common way that they express a little bit of discomfort. Um, if we can identify the earliest signs that the dog is uncomfortable, we can, we can back off then and uh, prevent any escalation whatsoever. And if you, if you can read your dog that way, it's, it's really cool. Uh, to see how their trust in you grows because they understand that you understand them and and you respect them and you're listening and it's it's a really good way to build uh, a really nice relationship with your dog. Um, so what about those triggers? Um, first of all, we kind of touched on this too is that a lot of dogs um, will either guard from other dogs or they will guard from humans. Um, you don't tend to see a lot of overlap there. Um, most dogs, um, if they guard at all, it's from one or the other. Um, and uh, with, uh, with dog to dog guarding, um, as long as it's not injurious, um, I prefer to just either do nothing or, or just manage it so that they're not having repeated little tiffs. Um, with human guarding, um, like I said, I, I really enjoy training uh, these these sorts of behaviors out. Um, so I, I prefer to prevent and train it um, if it's guarding from humans. Um, but that's that's my preference. Uh, like I said, you've got choices in, uh, in your home with your dog. Um, but some other things you can do, if your dogs don't do any of this stuff, um, or you don't think they do, or you've got a puppy and they might grow into a dog who does this, but they haven't yet. Um, you can, oh wait, I'm jumping the gun here. Let's talk, <laughs> sorry, first, um, also, uh, just like, you know, dogs tend to guard um, from either dogs or humans, they also only tend to guard certain things. Um, dogs will have, like I said, their list, and you're going to make a list for your dog um, of what they, they feel worthy of guarding. Um, and it could be anything. It really could. Um, dogs have guarded the weirdest things, um, but <laughs> they they often fall into these categories. So food or chewy items like bully sticks and kongs um, are really really common. I would say that's top, which is why I listed it first. Um, the dog's food bowl could even be just a single treat that gets dropped on the ground. It could be like a, like our brown dog in that first example there. Um, a human holding treats, even in a, a treat treat bag on their waist. Um, or it could be the chewies, like the bully sticks, a pig's ear, anything. Um, but food is is very, like, highly, highly valuable, which is why we use it for training, by the way. Um, but... Dizzy's he's, he's doing that growling again. This is just gonna be part of the <laughs> part of the thing. Dizzy growls at me. Um, no, uh, yeah. So so food and chewy things are just very very valuable to a lot of dogs. Worthy of guarding. Um, and that that high value aspect of food kind of it benefit benefits us in in terms of training, but also um, something that we just have to keep an eye on when uh, a dog does guard. But category two is they might guard random objects. And this is the funny one because it could be anything. It could be a dog toy. Uh, you'll see dogs uh, guard toys. Um, but I've also worked with clients whose dog guarded paper products. Paper products are really common too, actually. Um, it, it could be anything that the dog likes. Um, I listed water bowl here too because some dogs guard water. It's That one's a lot more rare, but Dizzy guards water bowls from dogs. Who knows? <laughs> um, locations. Um, a lot of times people will say, you know, my dog growls at me when he's on the couch or on my bed um, or on their bed, I guess. Um, and it's the same thing that dogs can guard locations. They can guard um, specific spots. You know, if they don't want to give up their spot on the couch, but they know that if you're coming and approaching him on the couch, you're probably going to make him move. That's when they get growly and guardy. Um, 
The funny one here is uh, holes in the dirt, holes in the sand. I know a lot of dogs who will will be out at the park, they'll dig a hole and then they'll guard it. And it's, I mean, who knows? Sometimes there's no explaining uh, dog behavior, but whew, that's what it is. That's what we, that's what we deal with. Um, and then lastly, uh, dogs can actually guard other dogs or humans. Um, we, as, as the dog owners, um, become very, very valuable resources to our dogs because obviously we provide everything of value in their life. Um, so sometimes they will guard a human from another dog or guard their human from another human. Um, I see this a lot with, uh, with couples um, whose dogs don't like it when they hug. Um, or for me, um, I, uh, I'm a dancer. I used to, bef you know, before these days, I used to uh, go social dancing and I would bring Dizzy uh, to the venues and he would lose his mind if I went to dance with somebody. And um, so yeah, that's a thing that can happen. Um, uh, I use Dizzy as an example because he's a garter, um, but he will uh, if we've been out at the park and he'll find a playmate that he really, really, really likes, and then if a third dog comes to uh, to join the party, he'll guard that first dog from the second. You know, um, it's just crazy. Um, but yeah, so so this uh, is all just to help you identify and list your dog's triggers. What are the things that they um, that they'll get guardy over? Um, now I can get to uh, how to prevent. These sorts of issues from ever happening. Um, really, really nice to do with a, a puppy or a dog that just came into your home. Um, if they've never shown any kind of aggression, uh, these are really, really easy things for us to do just to make sure it's never a problem. Um, so installment feeding is um, instead of uh, just, you know, taking a scoop of the dog's food, putting the bowl and putting it down, um, don't give the full bowl all at once. Uh, take a, a handful or just a smaller portion, put it in the bowl, uh, walk away, and then come back with another handful. Um, and I, I do like to make sure that we're using our hands in this scenario uh, because with a dog who's not shown any kind of, uh, any kind of aggression and there's no risk of, um, of your hands getting attacked, um, the hand being the thing that, that actually drops the food in there um, can make the dog have really nice feelings about human hands, uh, especially human hands approaching the bowl. Um, so yeah, uh, so you would just uh, repeat that until they've finished their meal. Um, really nice way to start. Um, next, uh, and I would do those these two in this order, um, is that if you do um, put a bowl of food down, you can walk away and come back and instead of putting more of the same food in the bowl, um, give, them, give them something that's higher value than what they have already. So if they've got kibble in the bowl, uh, you're going to walk away and come back with um, a chunk of chicken or cheese or steak, um, but make it really, really, really special. Um, so uh, so that the dog comes to learn that people approaching their bull, hands approaching their bull, usually means something really awesome is happening. Um, and so they get happy instead of uncomfortable with the whole situation. Um, and then the last one uh, is not have to do with the food bowl. This is more um, s uh, dealing with objects, um, is to practice random exchanges. So your dog has got something, uh, you approach them and touch it or even pick it up, um, give them, again, something really awesome and special. Uh, chicken, cheese, and steak are go-to's of mine, as long as the dog doesn't have allergies like my little guy down here. Um, but but yeah, pick, pick the object up, give them something special, and then give the thing back. Um, so if you just do this randomly, um, every just every so often, you don't even have to do it multiple times a day or every day or anything like that, but if you do this occasionally, um, the dog can learn again. We, we want them to know that people approaching their stuff means good stuff for the dog. Um, so these are, these are really nice strategies to do if the dog does not already do any kind of guarding. Um, I, I just want to stress that because, um, again, you know, we are talking about potentially aggressive behaviors and, uh, I, I want to keep safety at the forefront. So, um, if, if your dog is already showing these signs, we, we want to take a more cautious approach. Um, and 
and, and so you would just you would just um, the training plan would be a lot more broken down into smaller steps um, and making sure that the dog is never ever put in a situation that could be uncomfortable. Um, if you if you did these strategies with a dog who's already guarding, uh, you, there's a potential to to continue to push them over threshold, um, which may backfire. So um, yeah, this is this is prevention, um, and then. Um, some other things I just threw in here because um, if you are addressing this sort of thing, um, there's some other things that you can do. Um, now these uh, these little strategies here are, I mean, they're great for every dog, um, and doing one or any combination of these by themselves is not likely to fix any resource guarding. Um, but if you're working, if you are going through the training, uh, some of these things might help. Just just uh, help the training along. Um, and first one here is dog play. So again, like I said, uh, dogs who guard from other dogs, um, if they have more frequent positive uh, social interactions uh, with other dogs, uh, you're, they're gonna keep their social skills sharp, they're gonna be learning from each other um, every moment that they're interacting. Uh, not to mention, the physical exercise is good for their body and mind, you know? Um, I mean, gosh, how many self-help books out there talk about how good exercise is for our minds. It is It is the same for our dogs. Yes, it tires them out, which we love, um, but it's also really good for their doggy brains. Um, now, I don't recommend just throwing your dog into a play group if they have any other sort of uh, fear or aggression issues with dogs. Um, it's not, we don't want to overwhelm them, that's not good, that's uh, not, not going to help anybody. Um, but for a dog who's, who's otherwise very friendly with dogs, except when it comes to the resource, having more positive social, social interactions can be really good. Um, for the dogs who, for whom this is not a good fit, um, the physical exercise again can help, especially if it's a predatory type games like fetch and chase and tug. Um, it's a social interaction, at least with their human, um, and again, that physical exercise can help them out. Um, number two here uh, is the sniffari, uh, which is just a dog walk, but it's a dog walk where you kind of just let the dog lead the way, um, where they get to follow their nose and you let them spend as much time as they want sniffing that lamppost or that uh, tree or bush or fire hydrant, you know, they, they get to really do what dogs do, which is use their nose. Um, this is the highest form of enrichment for a dog and it really, really helps them. Um, it's, it's good for their brains and also it tires them out quite a bit like you um you know we like we like a, <laughs> the saying is you know a tired dog is a good dog so we like a tired dog um but you don't always have to take them for a run you know you could just let them take uh let them take you rather uh for a for a snafari and it, it it tires them out a lot more than you'd think it would um really really nice enrichment um for our doggies um and then finally um just more training um and it doesn't have to be uh, training uh, surrounding resource guarding exactly, but any sort of training that you do with your dog that is um, reinforcement reward based, um, because uh, if you're using if you're doling out food, um, again they're learning that food is coming from you. You are a giver, <laughs> um, and it could be anything like whatever whatever type of training you like. It could be working on obedience stuff. It could be teaching tricks. Um, if you work on impulse control, that could especially help. Stuff like uh, waiting at doors or waiting for the food bowl or a leave it um, with stuff on the ground, um, or uh, one that's um, can be a little bit trickier to teach, um, it, but if, if you teach the dog to retrieve items that that are guarded, that can really, really help. Um, so uh, these are these are nice um, adjunct strategies uh, that can help. Um, not likely to fix it but on their own, but again, they're, they're really nice and they're really good for all dogs, um, even the ones that don't guard. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, just, just wanted to check in um, if anybody has any more questions, anything that kind of... Uh, cropped up along the way, uh, do let me know because we're coming to the end here. I just wanted to, um, just quick review, um, just to mention again that guarding dogs are not bad dogs. Guarding is totally normal and, um, and they, reserve, they deserve to be um, 
uh, to be respected, to have their feelings respected. Um, number two, uh, learn to speak dog. You know, their, our dogs communicate with their body language um, and they all are individuals and they communicate in their own little way. So learn, learn your dog. Um, and then finally, uh, you've got options. Um, you can manage, you can train it, you can do nothing. Uh, just whatever you do, don't punish your dog for, for aggressive behavior. Um, I, I don't want to see you, uh, I don't want to see you go down that road. It's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, I love to be proactive. Uh, so I just always suggest preventing issues before their issues. Um, dodge those problems altogether. And uh, your dog's going to love the strategies anyway. So it's just good bonding. It's just a good thing. Um, so yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So um, I'm just gonna say thank you, you know? Uh, thank you all for, for joining me and for your comments. And um, oh, and I just uh, wanted to mention, um, if, if you found this helpful or entertaining at all, um, it really, really helps me out. Um, if you either subscribe to my channel, like my page, or share the video with someone who it might benefit, um, that can be really, really helpful. Um, and then if you, um, if you are interested in deeper training on, on how to actually address this with a dog, um, I can help with, I, I offer behavior consultations, one-to-one uh, -one behavior consultations, um, or I can provide uh, additional resources or referrals uh, if you prefer a trainer in your specific area. Um, but yeah, I can help. Um, my email's down there, uh, hello at jennifermalloway.com. Um, so yes, this is this is one of my favorite issues. So I, I, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and, uh, and that's all folks. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining me, um, and I will see you on Friday. All right. Have a good one, y'all. Alrighty. Bye-bye.